When it comes to identities and experiences that we haven't come across in real life or been taught about in schools, we tend to rely on the media to teach us about them. Now, this media might be documentaries or news reports, things that are factual, or fictional books, TV shows, or films. Now, sometimes the media produced about these identities or experiences is empathy-filled. It's got accurate information based on lived experiences and deep research, but sometimes it doesn't. This kind of flawed representation in media might replicate damaging tropes or include the spread of misinformation. The importance of representation is something that I talk about a lot on this channel, and that's the reason why I wanted to make this video today. What happens to identities and experiences that we might not see around us, that we aren't taught about in schools, and that don't have much representation in the media? Well, it turns out a lot of myths and misconceptions start to form. When you look for media with asexual and aromantic protagonists in, it's almost impossible. A lot of lists of ace or arrow characters will be side characters or characters that are just headcanoned to be that by their fans, not anything that's explicit in the text itself. And that was why I was so excited when I got sent this new book in the post. It's called Loveless by Alice Oseman and it has an arrow ace protagonist. I read this book in like a day, I know it's the ultimate cliche, couldn't put it down, but I genuinely couldn't. Um, as an asexual lesbian, this was a kind of representation that I had never seen before and it just made me feel so seen. So if a sort of Arrow Ace coming of age novel with multiple queer characters, um, a Shakespeare play because you know the queers love a good Shakespeare play, amazing female friendships, if that kind of appeals to you, oh my god check this book out, you will not regret it. So I reached out initially to see if Alice would be interested in being in like a debunking uh, video and HarperCollins very generously offered to just sponsor this whole video. Um, so I'm going to leave a link in the description for you to find out more about the book or buy it if you want because it is out now. And without further ado, let's Bust some myths. So what do we mean by asexual and aromantic? Well, there are different definitions and different wordings, but here is what we're gonna go with. Asexual means experiencing little to no sexual attraction. Sexual attraction meaning attraction towards a specific person that leads to a desire for sexual contact with them. Aromantic means experiencing little to no romantic attraction. Romantic attraction is generally defined as attraction towards a specific person that leads to a desire for a romantic relationship with that person. It's worth noting that aromantic and asexual are also umbrella terms that cover a wide range of different feelings, experiences and identities. And if you're still confused, hopefully the rest of this video will clear up any misunderstandings or myths that you might have heard. Myth 1. Asexuality and aromanticism are the same thing and you have to be both. So hopefully the definitions have sort of busted this myth for us, but aromanticism and asexuality are different things. So you can be both, you can be neither, or you could be one or the other. So some people feel that their romantic attraction and their sexual attraction are very similar, or they feel like the same thing. So a lot of gay and straight and bi and pan people feel like their attraction is kind of, it, their romantic and sexual attraction is linked together. But often for asexual and aromantic, and people of other sexualities, um, the, they just feel like two different things. But again, not always. Like for me, I'm aromantic and asexual, and I feel like they're quite linked together. They feel like a similar thing, part of a similar thing to me. Um, so yeah, just remember it varies for different people. Yeah, exactly. So you may have sexual attraction to all genders. You might for that example, identify as pansexual, um, but only feel romantic attraction towards one gender. There are also other kinds of attraction that, again, for a lot of people, are all bundled up into one. Uh, things like aesthetic attraction, so attraction to the way that someone looks, or uh, sensual attraction, a desire for touch which isn't necessarily sexual but sensual in nature. And again, you might experience all, none, or a mixture of these different types of attraction. Myth number two, being asexual is just a choice not to have sex. Obviously, this is very untrue. Um, asexuality is not the same thing as just choosing not to have sex. It's not the same thing as abstinence or celibacy or anything like that. Um, I think it's important to remember that asexuality is about a lack of attraction. It's nothing to do with choice or deciding not to have sex. Um, and it's also worth remembering that lots of asexuals do have sex anyway. <laughs> Myth three, being asexual just means you're a late bloomer or you're immature. 
So I think that this myth comes from the idea that people who do experience sexual attraction know that at one point when they were younger, they didn't. And so they assume that everyone who doesn't is just on the same journey as them and it's just a matter of time, but that is not necessarily the case. So the idea of being a late bloomer is actually something that comes up a lot in my book, Loveless, which you can see in the corner here. Um, it's something that the protagonist, Georgia, worries about a lot. She especially at first she thinks oh well I can't be asexual I'm just a late bloomer like I just need to wait until I find the right person but it's actually this idea that kind of hinders her on her journey and it's actively kind of harmful to her to in in helping her discover her sexuality so yeah I think it's it's not a good idea to be going around telling asexuals that they're just late bloomers because it's not helpful. Yeah, I think this brushing off of people who have a sincerely held identity is quite infantilizing or dismissive of the way that they feel. Um, and yeah, it also means that people are put in a position where they might be starting to question whether they could be aromantic or asexual and this kind of cuts them off from the exploration by saying no no that's not what you are you're this you just haven't reached that stage yet um so i think that it's always really healthy to keep options open to make sure that people can really look into um explore and research different identity to see what fits to them rather than just saying to them don't worry you'll be that normal one you just gotta wait a bit longer before it happens it's also one of my personal pet peeves when people find out that I'm Arrow Ace and they just assume that I'm like a baby who cannot even like deal with the idea of talking or hearing about sex or romance. Um, it's just very annoying. Like I'm 25 years old. I know what sex is. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's just very annoying. Myth four. Being asexual or aromantic is just a phase. I feel like this is quite similar to the last one. The big issue with it is that it really invalidates people's experiences, the way that they're, and their identities as well. Um, yeah, I think that this is the same argument that's tossed out a lot of other sexualities, like gay people and bi people. Um, pe even everyone who's not straight kind of gets told, like, this is just a phase, you'll just grow out of it one day. Um, and I mean, sometimes sexuality and identity does change over time, but often it doesn't. And going around telling people, oh no, it's okay, you'll change one day, you'll grow out this, that's just not helpful to anyone. There are people, a lot of people who identify one way and then they identify a different way. And that doesn't mean that those identities are inherently a phase or that that was a lie. That was how you sincerely identified at the time or the way in which you wanted to label yourself. I think that like we would never say that just because someone used to identify as straight and now identifies as gay that being straight is a phase um and so i think that we can all understand that that's that's not the case with other sexualities either myth number five everyone is either completely asexual or completely sexual and completely aromantic or completely romantic there is no in between so there's a bit in loveless where georgia the protagonist is googling asexuality and aromanticism for the first time and she is just bombarded with information um, and she says something like you know being asexual wasn't it, it wasn't like a graph it was like a radar chart with a dozen different axes um, and I think that kind of sums up asexuality and aromanticism because it is complicated like there's a lot to learn about it. Now, I think that all sexualities are not just on a spectrum um like the Kinsey scale is probably the one that people have heard of most often um because there are all of these different ways in which we experience and identify and different feelings that we might have at different times um and I think that asexuality and aromanticism is like part of that map web uh, situation um, and I don't necessarily think that that being quite complicated needs to be a scary thing or a worrying thing I think that the reason why it's so complicated is because because it can be quite freeing for people to say oh wait this really specific thing that I'm feeling that I'm starting to articulate about myself is the same thing that someone else is feeling that I'm not alone and so I don't necessarily think of it as a scary thing I think of it as something that's quite positive to a lot of people to have that kind of complexity available. So it's worth noting here that within the kind of spectrum web of asexuality and aromanticism, you have uh, identities like Demi and Grey, which are ways in which people experience attraction that is kind of 
I guess in between the two extremes in some way or another. And I also think one of the really interesting things about this web that takes um, experiences and wants and desires into account means that we start to unpick what heteronormativity has said is normal and expected and you can decide the kind of things that you want and don't want. Even if you're someone who is straight, there will be particular experiences or particular activities or wants or sexual acts or things like that that are expected of you within the overarching idea of what it means to be straight that you don't necessarily have to want or do. And so I think that, again, this web is something that isn't something to be feared, but something that can really be liberating to a lot of people. Myth six, asexuals never have sex and hate the idea of it. Again, this is kind of following on from the last myth. There is or can be a difference in people's experiences, their wants, their sex drive, their desires, their identity. Those things don't necessarily match up. So this might be a repetitive point, but uh, the important thing to remember about asexuality and aromanticism is that they're just a lack or little um, sexual or romantic attraction. Uh, it's really nothing to do with anything else. Like, even if you are asexual or aromantic, you could feel all sorts of different ways about having sex, about being in relationships, about romance, you know, like, it's, it's just, like we've said, it's a big web of all different experiences and feelings. So some asexual people have a sex drive and a libido, some don't, uh, some will masturbate, some won't, some will have sex with their partners, uh, and some won't, and the reasons for that are not sexual attraction, but other reasons, so they might have sex with their partners to feel close to them, um, because it feels physically good, um, but yeah, as Alice said, it's just not something that's based on sexual attraction. Myth number seven, aromantic people cannot have a fulfilling life because romantic relationships are the most important thing. So obviously this is such a myth and one of the big messages in Loveless is that you can find a happily ever after without romance and that platonic relationships can be just as powerful and special as romantic relationships. Um, unfortunately, we live in a society where romance is kind of lauded as the best thing ever and everyone should be aspiring to find the one and fall in love and have an amazing love story. But the reality is that, you know, some people just don't, won't feel happy experiencing that. So we should all be able to find that kind of joy and happiness in platonic relationships as well. Myth eight, asexual and aromantic people are broken slash unnatural. Similar to the all pervasive idea of like the happily ever after romantic ending, just our media advertising, um, it's, it's our humor even, is all so based on sex, romance and relationships. And so it's completely understandable that if you are not experiencing that attraction that it might make you feel like there's something wrong with you. And I think this is one of the really important reasons to talk about aromanticism and asexuality is to allow people to imagine a fulfilling life that doesn't necessarily involve those things. Um, to not force yourself to want to want something um, that doesn't come to you naturally and that isn't something that you're going to be happy trying to strive towards. Um, I'd just add to that 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 idea kind of benefits everyone, even people who aren't asexual or aromantic, like feeling pressured to find the perfect love story is not a good thing for anyone, no matter your sexuality. So understanding that you shouldn't have to strive for that idealised life and you should just try and enjoy you know, what, what you have is a good thing for everyone. One really big issue for the asexual and aromantic communities is that they're often seen as being mental illnesses or things that need to be treated, often by, even by doctors or therapists. Um, it's just quite a big issue in the community um, and it shouldn't be a thing. Although it is worth noting because obviously we love a bit of nuance uh, and nothing is always black and white, um, that there will be people who experience um, asexuality because of trauma uh, and that's something that might last a short amount of time, it might be something that's with them for a long amount of time um, and this doesn't negate or undermine people who identify as asexual um, and it's my personal belief that the resources and the information that are available to the asexual community should be available to anyone who experiences that in any way um, if that is something that they think is going to help them. Um, so it's it's one of those things that needs a bit of nuance that there it's not inherently a mental illness, but there may be some people that experience it for reasons other than it being their inherent sexuality. And 
those things can coexist together. Myth number nine, asexual people are anti-sex positivity. Uh, so being sex positive, the idea that you support people owning their sexuality and doing what they want with regards to sex, um, there's no reason why asexuals would be against that at all. Um, in Loveless, actually, the protagonist, Georgia, uh, her roommate at university is very, very sex positive, very uh, outgoing. She likes to express herself sexually a lot <laughs> um, and I wanted that to be one of the most important relationships in the story because it, even though the, uh, Georgia and her roommate Rooney they have very different experiences and feelings about sex and about relationships they can still respect each other and learn a lot from each other um, and that's how things should be. Being asexual again it is not a moral choice um, and therefore it's not a choice that you can then impose on other people or a kind of morality you can you would want to impose on other people um, just because there are some asexual people who are never going to have sex or might be what's called sex repulse so for them personally it is never something that they want to participate in that is not then uh, a feeling that they are going to project onto other people or expect other people to feel as well. Um, so yeah, completely a myth. Myth 10. Asexual and aromantic people don't like reading or talking about sex and romance. Hello, it's me, the creator of a YA romance graphic novel series. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is completely a myth. Like, I love reading and watching romance movies and books. Um, and the protagonist of Loveless, Georgia, uh, it's, you know, in the second chapter, she's like, I love romance, I love fan fiction, I love Disney. Just because someone is asexual or aromantic doesn't mean that they can't enjoy reading about it or watching it on TV. Again, it's, it's, it's this spectrum, it's different experiences that people have. There will be some aromantic or asexual people who might not be interested in, in that kind of media. Myth 11, asexual and aromantic people are just too unattractive to get a partner. So this honestly just sounds like something that just a mean school playground bully would say, and it's also like a thousand percent untrue. Yeah, this is definitely untrue. Um, like personally, I have had opportunities to have a relationship but I've always just been like mm, no thanks <laughs> so yeah it's not for lack of opportunity this is yeah this is just a weird bullyish argument that makes no sense and it's kind of pathetic <laughs> this is actually something that our race activist Yasmin Benoit has talked about a lot um she's a British our race activist uh, she goes on loads of shows and does loads of articles and stuff specifically talking about the misconception that asexuals have a specific look or they dress a specific way um, and Yasmin herself is a professional model as well so there you go. <laughs> Myth number 12, they have no emotions and can't feel love and that the representation we see on screen of sexless aliens or unfeeling robots are good representations of real people. Yeah, I personally think that the complete lack of representation is what contributes to this. Um, people don't really have any idea of what asexual and aromatic people are like because they're just not on TV, they're very rarely in books. Um, and popular characters that have been, you know, decided that they're asexual by fans are often people like Sherlock from BBC's Sherlock. Sheldon Cooper from The Big Bang Theory, people who are often quite unfeeling. Um, whereas we need more positive representation of actual well-rounded people. Like, for example, I really liked the representation um, of an asexual character in season two of Sex Education. Although it was very short and kind of shoehorned in, it was actually about a girl who has a whole personality. She's passionate about theatre, like she's you know, got this whole life and she's not some sort of unfeeling, emotionless person. Um, and that's what I think we need more of generally. Yeah, I was really excited to see that in sex education as well. I think they've tackled a lot of different kinds of sexualities and that felt quite missing for me from season one, especially because I know quite a lot of people wanted the main character to be asexual. So I was really excited to see that as well. One of the earliest adopters of different um, identities or experiences, um, especially in the UK, is often soap operas. Um, we tend to see like the first kiss on screen in the UK, like all this stuff. They, they always tend to be in soap operas. I've talked about this before, but for a couple of different reasons, including the idea that if the character doesn't go down well, they can just 
remove the character without much of an issue because there's so many other characters that can fill in this <laughs> fill in their shoes um but it does end up being quite pioneering and so we had i think what must be one of the first asexual characters on uk tv in 2018 with the character of Liv in emmerdale um who came out as asexual um i love Liv, and i love the way that they did that storyline she has um her brother is gay and had a really really pioneering storyline he's been on the soap since he was a, a kid and they kind of have followed him through his whole life so far and so it was really interesting getting to see um a gay and asexual sibling and the way in which they communicate with each other explain their sexualities to each other um and just really love each other through everything um and so yeah to see this teenage girl character work that out about her sexuality and try and find a relationship with someone that would understand that part of her was and is really exciting to see. And finally, on to our last myth. Myth 13, asexual and aromantic are just fake identities invented by Tumblr. This is just fundamentally untrue. Um, that there's been evidence of asexual involvement in the LGBTQ plus community and movements throughout the 20th century. Um, so asexuality existed as a label long before the invention of Tumblr, and it's definitely a myth that Tumblr had anything to do with its creation. The, the internet didn't invent asexuality or aromanticism. What it has done, however, is allow people to spread information um, and advice and to allow people to meet each other and to find each other and to make them feel less alone. And of course, just because the words didn't exist at one point, that doesn't mean that people weren't still those identities. People will have been asexual and aromantic throughout history, just like they have been all other sexualities. So those were 13 myths busted. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, Alice, if people want to know more about what you do or find you on the internet, where should they be looking? You can come and follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Alice Oseman, or you can find out more about Loveless <laughs> or any of my other books uh, on my website, aliceoseman.com. In the comments, I would love to hear about the types of aromantic and asexual characters you would like to see represented in media. As always, if you would like to help support me make these videos, I'll leave a link to my Patreon, uh, as well as all my social media, so you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.